HBCU Digest Radio, welcome back. I'm your host, Jared Carter, and today we are excited to have uh, an esteemed author, uh, professor uh, at Morehouse uh, uh, in the past and currently at Norfolk State University, Curtis Bunn, uh, the author of more than nine uh, successful novels on Essence bestsellers list. Here to talk with us today about his career and his genesis at the great Norfolk State University. So, uh, Professor Bunn and Brother Bunn, I should say, it is indeed an honor to have you on today. Uh, Brother Carter, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So t- first, give us some insight because you have this unique track in your your teaching and learning. So you're, you're at Norfolk State, but you live mm-hmm. in Georgia. So clearly you're the hardest working man in the HBCU community <laughs> uh, by mileage yeah. and by Tom Jordan's definition. But t- tell us how that worked out that you returned to your alma mater to teach, uh, but you still keep uh, residence in Georgia. Well, I'm very proud of Norfolk State in general, and specifically the outgoing president, Dr. Melvin Stepp, and vice president of advancement, Dr. Deborah Fontaine, who met with me in Atlanta February of last year, 2018, over brunch. And during that conversation, talked about the idea of bringing back Spartans to Norfolk State who have done substantial work in, in particular professions to teach. It was. I was excited. I've gone back to Norfolk State over the years, having graduated in 1983 and worked at the school newspaper during my four years. I've gone back over the years many, many times to speak to the student newspaper, to speak to news writing classes, to speak to students in general as the Marsh Grand Marshal of the Homecoming Parade, as a distinguished alumni. So I'm very much connected to Norfolk State and bleed green and gold. But the opportunity to teach was always something that I really wanted to do, but I live in Atlanta and really love living in Atlanta. So that was a uh, that was a uh, prohibiting factor. Well, they were innovative in saying, "Why don't we fly you up once a month and you teach the other three month three weeks of the month online?" Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Wow, this works for me." My wife, who's a Norfolk State graduate as well, was excited about the opportunity, and we implemented this this hybrid sort of class of creative writing where I go up to Norfolk State once a week, once a month rather for a week, teach the students, uh, teach them online during the rest of the month. And we've had great success. I've seen so much uh, tremendous improvement in the students. And this idea that we're creating the next generation of authors is very exciting to me. So to do it at Morehouse was outstanding because it's an HBCU. And I love that I, I taught sports reporting there. My, my background is as a sports journalist also, but to do it at Norfolk State, a, a school in which I was raised, coming in at 17 years old, somewhat unsure of myself and leaving at 21, four years later, ready to take on the world and become a journalist, uh, it, it means that much more to me. Talk about that time in Norfolk. They obviously have a tremendous mass comm program. Um, mm-hmm. it, talk about what the tools and the experiences that you gained at Norfolk that helped you to become and enter into the sports writing realm and how you eventually transitioned to novel writing and creative writing? Yeah, it, it really started before I even went to North State. I, I grew up in Southeast Washington, D.C., and my English teacher in junior high school, Mr. Overton, told me about journalism, and I started pursuing it then, even though in my heart I was going to be in the NBA, like most young men uh, <laughs> at 13 years old. Right. But I went to Blue High School and I studied journalism. I was the editor of the paper in my junior year and went to the Penn Career Development Center in my, sen- in my senior year in the mornings and Blue in the afternoon. So I went to Norfolk State with the idea that I was going to study journalism and work for the student newspaper. And that was really the heart of everything for me, working for the Spartan Echo newspaper, uh, from really my first week there to my last week over the four years, working with guys like Dirk Dingle, who's now the, um, one of the editors, the editor right. at yep. Black Enterprise, and mm-hmm. Leon Carter, who is at ESPN, who's sort of been a mentor to me all my all of my career, certainly earlier in my career. And we had professors who cared, and so they prepared us through the newspaper. It was a practical way to, to write, to get clips, to learn from your mistakes, to grow, And by the time I graduated from Norfolk State, I had three job offers and and my career was launched. But Mm -hmm. it it was a very nurturing environment as as HBCUs are. It was a learning environment that um, allowed you to learn from your mistakes. And I gained gained a great passion for the Spartan Echo newspaper. I I maintain that 
that passion for 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 the Spartan Echo, even as it right now is going is undergoing a revamping, so to speak. And I hope to be heavily involved in that uh, at some point. It it was even when I was coming along in the nineties, in the early two thousands. Um, mm-hmm. HBCU school newspapers were were a big deal, um, and not just for the yeah. stuff like twenty questions, where you know we throw something out there mm-hmm. that's crazy. Uh, but they were they were de- we were definitely covering substantive issues on campus and in the community. As you look at yeah. the landscape and you work with your students at Norfolk State today, because the Spartan Echo is still a really good still a really good paper. Um, do you see that? That that spirit of journalism and, and quality news writing and quality coverage of the campus is still there, or do we find that it, it's a little bit different because this is a different generation of writers, a different standard or a different culture of, of news and news reporting because of online access and blogging and social media? How do you kind of speak to your students about the tradition of journalism, particularly black journalism, and the, the way that we meld it with new media and digital media? It's an excellent question. Um, I'm somewhat in an awkward position because I really want to take over the Spartan Echo as the, its advisor. The advisor, from my understanding, who was there, has recently left. The newspaper hadn't come out regularly at all. I mentioned earlier I've spoken to the Spartan Echo students over the years, and I have to be honest, quite disappointed in what it uh the, 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 the lack of production. We came out every week with a special section during the CIAA basketball tournament and SGA elections mm-hmm. every year for four years. They're coming out two or three times a semester mm-hmm. with much more technology. So it starts with leadership. And I think you have to have someone in the advisor role who actually cares about it, who uh, is, this is a unique opportunity because I work there, I have a passion for it. And, 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 I, and I've worked in journalism since 1983. Mm-hmm. So all those elements matter. Uh, when I was there, I helped get the basketball coach fired. I was, that wasn't my intention. But <laughs> Most of us who, have done, who did a good job at our paper tried to get somebody fired. I think that's a, that's a right you know, of <laughs> You know, we, 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 we weren't chilly. We, we supported the school, obviously. Mm-hmm. But we've tried to function as a viable news source. And so... The, the players rebelled against the, the coach. They told me about it. I wrote about it. And the local newspapers and televisions ended up picking it up. Mm-hmm. And the school did an investigation. The coach was fired. We challenged the SGA president. We challenged the president, Dr. Harrison B. Wilson, who was probably the greatest president at Norfolk State. Mm-hmm. Um, he respected the paper. He didn't like everything we wrote because sometimes they think we're supposed to be a PR vehicle. Mm-hmm. That's not. That should not be the case. Right. Um, with with the internet mentioned, you know, moving to today's world of journalism, there's no reason for the, the the Spartan Echo to not be a viable source on the internet. There should be stories every day about student life and the issues that concern students um, every day, and they're real life issues. I talk to the students beyond what I'm teaching them, and they have they have real life struggles and concerns about what's going on on campus or what's going on in the world. And then not right now using that outlet of the, of the student newspaper as a voice. And so I definitely would like to be a part of bringing that back and making it a viable resource for students to go to for happy news, for sad news, but for news that really matters to them. And that, that's the most important thing. I get the sense, and not to belabor this, but I get the sense that it's just different. I don't know if it, I'm sure it was like this for you guys as it was for us. When we were in school, we would go to class and then go to the newspaper office. Like yes. we, we hung out at the paper, like we... We stayed yes. up late and, and, and <laughs> snuck in the building and hid it from security so we could lay out the paper and put it to bed. Yes. Like So yes. most of us who kind of came of age like right just before digital media started emerging, we know what it's like to actually mm-hmm. put a physical paper out and why that requires so much work and why you want to do it every week or you know every other week. Maybe, mm-hmm. do, do you think that, that that's different because you can almost post news instantly now? Or is it that because students may have a different lifestyle where they don't they don't necessarily have to or want to hang out at the at the newspaper office when they're not in class or not sleep you know for sure <laughs> for sure it's, it's different on a number of levels for one i i remember asking my students at morehouse where they're from in the first day and they all tell me where they were from and the kid would say he's from st louis or minnesota and i'm like so have you ever purchased the mini the minneapolis starlet mm-hmm 
newspaper. No. And I go around the room. They had never even purchased, purchased a newspaper, newspaper before. Right. Mm -hmm. So the idea of an actual physical paper just doesn't job with them so i said so where do you get your news and they said twitter <laughs> right so it, <laughs> so it was very disheartening for a newspaper man who grew up with newspapers and i worked in new york for 11 years yeah. i read five papers a day mm -hmm. and so uh, it, it is a different dynamic for sure it, there's a in the internet with all of its virtues of course many um probably the greatest invention of all time but it has its downfalls and and that's one is the the, the, the deterioration of newspapers and journalism as we knew it where you were careful about what you wrote you had to get second and third sources to confirm stories as opposed to trying to just be the first person to get it and it, that's why p the trust in journalism has deteriorated so where you, you can read something in the paper and generally you hear all the time well you know what that may not be true and then it may, you know what it may not be the next day or the next hour there's an update that they talk to someone else and it's a totally different story. Mm -hmm. So the, the game has changed significantly and I think it's important that if we have young students in colleges, particularly at our, at our HBCUs, then we need to hone them to do the, to, to master this craft the right way and so that they can tell the stories that we need to be told in the proper way. Sadly, there are less African Americans in newsrooms now than they were when I started in 1983. There was always this big push, and it talks about the percentages of African Americans in newsroom and sports departments in this department and that department. And now it's diminished less in a time when it's we're supposed to be more progressive. So we have to produce young journalists who understand the value of what the profession is, what it really, what the, the code of conduct, and how to do it the right way. And that's where, uh, where folks like us come in where we have the opportunity to, to touch these students and show them how it should be done. And hopefully they will gain a passion for it that we have uh, that can really make change in how we perceive and how we project it in news out news outlets. All that, you know, we can, we can sit up here and talk shop all day, brother, I'm sure. Uh, but <laughs> but, the, but the, the, the biggest thrust of your career for which you're so well known um, is your work as an author. Um, nine mm -hmm. titles, Essence bestseller. Talk about that transition into creative writing. How did it it, it, it spark? And how did you, uh, let me ask you this question. How did you become self-made in that way, in that field? And what, did it, what, what, is, what is a piece of advice that you would give a student who may be listening now if you want to be an author and write novels and write, uh, mm -hmm. you know, fiction or even nonfiction? What, what is the way to get started, get a deal, self-publish? What are some of the, the, sure. the strategies behind it? Sure. And that's a, there's a lot to that answer. For one, I grew up as a reader, didn't even realize I was one. It was just natural. Mm -hmm. My mother and father got us books when we got our electric football men and rock and sock and robots as well. And I read the books. And so I grew up reading. Now you'd be classified as an avid reader. But then I was just reading because they were there and I enjoyed them. Um, I read Waiting to Excel on the beach in Maui in I think 1992. And I loved it. And I, but I said, you know, I could do this. I can write a book, uh, just from a male's point of view. Mm -hmm. I never considered novel writing before. Some, uh, as a sports writer in New York, a few athletes talked to me about writing their memoirs, but never thought about a novel. Well, seven years later, I started writing a book called Baggage Check about three guys who love, who have a great friendship with each other, but with women, they have trouble because they carry baggage from one relationship to the next. Mm -hmm. And I started writing that book without an outline, without any notion of where I was going, and fell in love with writing novels. I'm a journalist first. I always call myself a journalist first because I fell in love with journalism at 13. Mm -hmm. But I love writing novels because it's much more liberating. I don't have to worry about facts. I can create the facts. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I wrote Baggage Check. It was published by a black publishing company in New York called a and Books. And the book did great, fantastic. It was number one on the SS bestseller list, and I had a new passion. And so I started writing and ended up getting deals with uh, Simon & Schuster for about seven books. I've written 10. I'm working on it in 11. And so the transition for me was uh, I was still working as a journalist here in Atlanta at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution when I started writing books. And um, I was able to transition from the AJC, taking the buyout in 2009, because I had started this writing career and 
teaching and also I do a literary conference, annual conference called the National Book Club Conference each year. We'll have our 17th conference in August. And so I had these other things going on, but um, the transition helped me, well, my career as a journalist helped me because I had a command of the language and combining that with an imagination that I didn't know was so vast, uh, I became this, this author that, uh, that I've enjoyed writing uh, and reading and others have enjoyed reading. It's, it's, uh, it's self-publishing is an easy path nowadays. There are very, there's several vehicles to do that, mm-hmm. even including via Amazon. I would advise anyone who chooses that route to do it with the idea that you're going to put your best foot forward. And I know that sounds like a very simple concept, do your best, but that's what's required because readers are serious readers and they're going to see through uh, weak storylines and they're going to notice editing er- editing mistakes or typographical uh, punct- punctuation errors. So you have to get an editor who is reliable, who is experienced, and who is going to give you the hard truths. That editor can't be your friend <laughs> because as much as friends love you, because they love you so much, they can't give you an honest critique. If they don't like it, it's hard to say to your friend, you need to go back to the drawing board you're almost always going to get a positive response. So you have to get an impartial judge who understands the language, understands storytelling, who can give you some feedback that's going to be helpful in you pursuing this um, this, this line of work. So you, you've been acclaimed in journalism. You've been acclaimed in novel writing. Um, you said you're working on the 11th book. Uh, there, there's so much that you've conquered in this in this field of arts. And so for you, What is it like when you see our HBCUs and just education in general taking a very, very close and and intricate look at how can we become more STEM oriented, technically oriented, which is good to keep pace with technology. But where do Mm -hmm. you see the role of the arts, the role of communication, the role of the written word in going in the future, particularly for black communities? Sure. I, I think it's critical for sure, STEM and technology uh, is, the, is the present and the future. But at the same time, you have to be able to read and write with comprehension. It, it was it's a basic concept from way back when we were growing up. But I think even more so today because we're in such different times, such challenging times. And these millennials, uh, and I really enjoy being around them, listening to them and talking to them to get their perspective on things. And they're, they, they're different thinkers than we are. If this is a time in which it has to be the time that has to be documented, and it has to be documented by them, and documented by them in a way in which uh, makes sense, in which they can do it in an orderly fashion, in a fashion that's entertaining but also informative, and that's where journalism comes in. That's where the my creative writing class comes in, and other courses at North State's English Department and other HBCUs around the country. The arts will never go away. Music, books. Even if they you know, I know that there are a lot of people who like the electronic reading. I love, I love holding a book in my hand. Whether it's uh, through, uh, no matter which way, people are going to want to read, and stories are going to need to be told. And it's incumbent upon us, with our experience, to arm our young people who are in these HBCUs with the tools to, to tell those stories in a, in a viable way. And so I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm proud of Norfolk State for, for stepping out of the box to give me this opportunity to teach at Norfolk State while I live in Atlanta. Uh, it sounds crazy, but this, this hybrid is working so well and, and students are getting so much out of it um, because we need this from them. We need this from them. We need them to be prepared in a way that, uh, prepared by people who have done it. Not just people who are teaching out of out of, out of uh, textbooks. Obviously, that th- there's a place for that in some realms. But when it comes to writing and many t- many uh, aspects of the arts, it has to be people who've done it and who are doing it, who can guide them in a way and, in a way and give them practical knowledge and practical experiences to draw from. Brother, fantastic insight. Uh, tell us where we can find more about. Uh, you um, more about your your curriculum and the things that you yes. developed in the HBCU space in the way of teaching and more importantly where we can buy some of these books <laughs> well I appreciate that the books are everywhere uh, amazon.com barnesandnoble.com for sure 
Uh, my website is Curtis Bun, C U R T I S B U N N dot com. And my creative writing website is NSU Creative Writing dot com. And so, uh, part of my class is that I, the students are writing a short story throughout the semester, and I have their stories published on the website. And it gives them a, a publishing credit, but it also lets them, their friends and family, read their work to see how they progress through through the class. So, it's an important element of what, what I'm doing there in my class at Norfolk State. 